William Gibson is credited with being the father of cyberpunk, but do you know when and where the name cyberpunk was coined? In 1983 or 84, Willie Cyros, who chaired Armadillicon in Austin, Texas, invited William Gibson to attend the con. Gibson, a cast-strapped beginning author, replied that he couldn't afford to attend. Fortunately, one of the fans in the Armadillicon orbit was lead engineer in a computer startup and had received a load of cash in company stock, so he paid for Gibson's trip. Willie then contacted Ellen Datlow, editor of Omni Magazine, whom Armadillicon had been trying to get to come to the con, and told her that William Gibson would be there. Datlow, who had published Burning Chrome, had been pining to meet Gibson, so she decided to come. News of Datlow's attendance got out, and a whole load of authors eager to meet the editor of Omni showed up. A lot of them, led by Bruce Sterling, were big fans of Gibson. So, during the con, the authors got together, and almost by accident, a movement was born. At the final panel, it was announced that the group was formed and would be writing a new style of SF named Cyberpunk. My suggestion for the name Art Techo which was actually pretty descriptive of the field at the time, was deemed not edgy and gritty enough. William Gibson was the leader and inspiration. Bruce Sterling was the high prophet and philosophical guide, and others like Lewis Shiner, Pat Cattingdon, wrote the fiction and spread the word. For a while, cyberpunk even eclipsed the new wave. Paul Cooper 3611. Comment in the video for the introduction to the Ace Science Fiction Specials Series 3. Burning Chrome, a collection of stories by William Gibson, 1986. Preface by Bruce Sterling, 1986. Ten stories from 1977 to 1985. Three of the stories are collaborations. Sterling writes in the preface, If poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, science fiction writers are its court jesters. We are wise fools who can leap, caper, utter prophecies, and scratch ourselves in public. We can play with big ideas because the garish motley of our pulp origins makes us seem harmless. And SF writers have every opportunity to kick up our heels. We have influence without responsibility. Very few feel obliged to take us seriously, yet our ideas permeate the culture, bubbling along invisibly like background radiation. Yet the sad truth of the matter is that SF has not been much fun of late. All forms of pop culture go through doldrums. They catch cold when society sneezes. If SF in the late 70s was confused, self-involved, and stale, it was scarcely a cause for wonder. But William Gibson is one of our best harbingers of better things to come. His brief career has already established him as a definitive 80s writer. His amazing first novel, Neuromancer, which swept the field's awards in 1985, showed Gibson's unparalleled ability to pinpoint social nerves. The effect was galvanic, helping to wake the genre from its dogmatic slumbers. Roused from its hibernation, SF is lurching from its cave into the bright sunlight of the modern zeitgeist. And we are lean and hungry and not in the best of tempers. From now on, things are going to be different. Welcome to Cyberpunk Week on Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. This is the second of three videos. In our first video, we looked at The Paradox Men by Charles L. Harness. Today, we're going to look at Burning Chrome, a collection of stories by William Gibson, 1986. And in our third video, we'll take a look at the classic Neuromancer by William Gibson as well. This is a very good collection of stories. I want to talk briefly about five of the ten stories, starting with Johnny Mnemonic. It's a very famous short story. The brief blurb of the story would be, there is a young man named Johnny who is cybernetically altered so that he can store data in his head. He does this anonymously for people who want to transfer data. Only they have the password. But now someone is out to get Johnny. It turns out that the data in his head comes from the Yakuza. He gains an ally in Molly Millions. She too has undergone surgery to insert technology. Hers is a lethal kind. 
Can she protect Johnny? How will they dispose of the data in Johnny's head? Molly Millions is a character we will see later in Gibson's writing. And she is a major influence, perhaps the template, for Trinity in the movie The Matrix. Gibson's prose combines hard SF and a gritty new wave noir, combining crisp dialogue and technological imagery. It's like nothing else you've read before. This is a new classic in SF short stories. Shifting gears, I'd like to comment on the belonging kind. Our protagonist, Coretti, meets a girl in the bar. This girl is easy to get along with. She seems to shift in character with the people that she talks to. Coretti follows her out of the bar. She goes to another bar and he follows her in. And somehow, she has changed clothing and her personality, even her voice, has changed. She eventually meets up with someone else, a male with the same abilities. He continues to follow them bar to bar. No matter how much they drink, they don't get drunk. Their metamorphosis is puzzling. They're like human wallpaper matching the rooms that they go to. This story is somewhat like a Twilight Zone story. The protagonist starts to wonder if he is going mad. Could there be shape-shifting beings finding their way through our society? The next story, Hinterlands, is the one that reminds me of Alfred Bester. A Russian astronaut accidentally discovers a hole in space just outside of Earth's orbit. Her spacecraft, originally bound for Mars, disappears. Five years later, it appears in the same point. She is dead, but she clutches alien technology. This sparks a gold rush of sorts. A space station is built. People want to go through that hole in space-time continuum and see if they can strike it rich. The problem is when people return, they commit suicide. Our protagonist is Toby, a surrogate, someone who is supposed to go into the capsule first to try to stabilize the passenger. Gibson describes us as a tribe seeking out civilizations. On page 85, it says, We aren't the only hinterland tribe, the only ones looking for scraps. Scraps of technology and knowledge. This is science fiction horror. It reminds me a bit of Stephen King's The Jaunt. The next story I'd like to talk about is The Winter Market. This is a story that feels like it's set in Vancouver, William Gibson's hometown. We have names like Cooverville or Burnaby or Granville. Once again, this story starts off in a bar and a man meets a woman named Lise who has an artificial neurological spine. She is a paraplegic, but this neurological spine interface allows her to move with grace, but her body doesn't feel a thing. I'm not going to tell you more about this story, but it made me think about William Gibson. It made me think that he's a time traveler that has come back into the 1980s and is using the technology of his day to wow us in science fiction, to give us a hope for the future, even though it can be a grim future too. To think that all these stories are written 1985 or earlier with concepts that still today ring true. He also has a knack for creating characters, believable characters with flaws and with some brilliant names. I'd like to talk about one more story, Dogfight. This is the story of a man down on his luck who is traveling down the east coast of the United States. Once again, we go into a bar and we see some men playing at a billiards table, but they're not playing billiards. They're playing a game where there are planes flying over the table. They are holographic representations that each of them can control. In fact, they can control a small squadron of three planes if they want. They have dogfights and battle each other for money. He goes into a truck stop and he sees that they're selling projective wetware wafers. In it, he finds the game, Spads and Folkers. I have to be careful how I say that. He purchases the game, wanting to practice and try to compete for money. Our protagonist also meets a girl, and she happens to be a software engineer. She is working with some technology that is three years in advance of that day. She helps him tweak the projective wetware, and he gets an advantage in the game. He begins to compete and wins, but winning 
brings him to attention of one of the best players of the game. Meanwhile, his girlfriend has made some advancements in research and is pitching a project to a company. She's going to use a drug to help her focus. But our protagonist wants this drug too for his competition. Not only do we have a dogfight in competition, but now we have a dogfight with this young couple. This story takes the concept to multiple levels. It may be, for me, the best story in the collection. But we haven't even talked about the namesake for the book, Burning Chrome. This is one of those stories that Ellen Datlow of Omni Magazine purchased. Here we have The Matrix. Yes. Once again, the influence for the Matrix film. Within this Matrix, we have hackers who are trying to make a score. The story alternates between our real world and that inside the Matrix. I'd like to read a passage or two from the story. Bobby was a cowboy, and ice was the nature of his game. Ice from ice. Intrusion countermeasures electronics. The Matrix is an abstract representation of the relationships between data systems. Legitimate programmers jack into their employer's sector of the matrix and find themselves surrounded by bright geometries representing the corporate data. Towers and fields of it ranged in the colorless non-space of the simulation matrix, the electronic consensus hallucination that facilitates the handling and exchange of massive quantities of data. Legitimate programmers never see the walls of ice they work behind, the walls of shadow that screen their operations from others, from industrial espionage artists and hustlers like Bobby Quine. Bobby was a cowboy. Bobby was a cracksman, a burglar, casing mankind's extended electronic nervous system, rustling data and credit in the crowded matrix, monochrome non-space where the only stars are dense concentrations of information and high above it all burn corporate galaxies and the cold spiral arms of military systems. William Gibson's vision for the future and his prose just crackle with energy. There's a dark noir feeling to a lot of his stories, an underworld that we need to explore. This is the emergence of an important figure in science fiction. I give Burning Chrome, 9 out of 10, an amazing collection of stories. So have you read some of these stories? What are your favorites? Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next video on Neuromancer. Until next time, keep reading.